Praise God for that time of worship. Amen. Amen. Man, I am so blessed by those who have the skills and the talents and the spiritual gifts to lead in worship like that. What a gift. Thank you so much for each and every one of them. A big shout out to each and every one of you. Thank you for joining us here today. Full house in this room. So I'm probably talking to the cafe as well. Those in the cafe and those online and those at our Orange Campus. Thank you so much for being here. I'm going to jump right in today. If you're new here, thank you for being here. I always say thanks for taking the risk because it's always a risk coming somewhere brand new. But God knew you were going to be here. He was moving on your spirit to come. And so I'm thankful that you're here. We we're in the middle, really kind of nearing the end of our series. We're walking through the letters to the seven churches in the book of Revelation. Today we're in the next to last letter, looking at the letter to the city, of, uh, the city and the church of Philadelphia. I'm going to jump right in asking a question. You don't have to raise your hand. You don't have to fill out a connect card. You don't have to sign up. You don't even have to tell the person who's hosting online what you believe about this. But how many of you, whether you've been here 10 minutes or been here 20 years, how many of you came to Mountain View looking for the perfect church? <laughs> okay, how many of you, to the church you went to before you came to Mountain View, you went to that church looking for the perfect church? No? Well, the fact is, you're right. They don't exist, Right? Because churches are made up of people, sinners saved by the grace of God, individuals looking for a fellowship, looking for community, looking for truth. I recognize the church is not a place where we exclude weakness, but we acknowledge our weakness, and we look for that union with God Almighty to come in and transform us from the inside out. So that what? You and I are able to persevere through this life while we wait for that glorious homecoming that we get to experience one day. And that perseverance is what I want to talk about today because that was the focus of the letter, the content of the letter to the Church of Philadelphia. If you've been here before, you recognize that John on the island of Patmos, I think it's the Adrian Sea, maybe it's the wrong sea, I can't remember, uh, or GNC. He's there, he's exiled out there. He writes the letters inspired by God. So we know he's penning the letters, but Jesus Christ is writing the letters to his churches. And today... As we define who this Jesus is, they use some Old Testament analogy to understand who Jesus is that's writing this letter. Look what was said. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, these are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. When he's, go ahead and leave that up for there for a minute. Because we look at the scripture, he says, to him who's holy. Let's go back to the Old Testament. Yell it out if you want to. Who in the Old Testament possesses absolute holiness? Who? God himself. That's it. God himself. Absolute holiness. Remember, Isaiah 6.3 solemnly declared, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. Then you get into the Messianic verses message in the New Testament. You see the word, words holy ones used in the New Testament. That's Luke chapter 4. That's John chapter 6 as a Messianic title for the Lord Jesus Christ. It's significant that we understand today that Jesus, the one that we worship, the one that took away our sins, we're going to share in communion today, the one that we're giving gratitude for for dying on that cross is infinitely and absolutely holy. But it doesn't stop there, does it? The Word of God says that He is holy and He's true. Aletheinos, it's in the Greek. The word simply denotes one who is genuine, one who is authentic, and one who is real. I encourage people to share the gospel with others. I encourage you to share your testimony with others. A lot of people sometimes say, you know what, it sounds so good what you're saying. But I just got one question for you. Is it true? Is what you're saying true? true. What are they really asking? It sounds good, but is it true? Is it real? Is it authentic? Is what you're telling me about Jesus genuine, or is it simply another pretend idol or something that's artificial? We get enough of that in the world on our media and politics in the news today. We can turn to someone and say, our Lord Jesus Christ is absolutely holy and absolutely true. Our Messiah delivers holy and true in the Bible. Sit there in the scripture. Look on the screen if you want to. He holds the key of David. 
The Old Testament prophesied that one who would sit on the reign, on the seat of King David for all eternity. We know that being the Lord Jesus Christ himself. In the Old Testament, there was only one who held the keys to the kingdom, and that was the king himself, unless the king designated and handed the key to some one of, one of his other designees. God himself has handed the key to the kingdom to the one and only Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. What does that mean? You know, because there's an absolute in that, the one and only Messiah. That means that out of Mormonism, Joseph Smith is not a Messiah. Do we believe that? Folks, Gandhi is not a Messiah. Muhammad is not a Messiah. Mayor Baker Eddy of the Scientist Church is not a Messiah. Jesus himself is the one and only God in the flesh, and he will determine, he and he alone will determine who participates in his kingdom and who will be turned away. I was like, oh, man, Mark, how can you say that? Well, it was right there in the scripture in 7b. I'm going to put that up for a second. What he, referring to the Lord Jesus Christ, what he opens, no one can shut. And what he shuts, no one can open. Jesus is no longer, we understand the baby in the manger, right? We understand that. We're going to spend a whole lot of time at Christmas. I know Thanksgiving's coming, but I'll just give that shout out now. We're doing something special on Christmas Eve. We're going to have a joint worship service with Culpeper Baptist here in town. It is a Sunday, and so we're not going to, nothing's going to happen here at Mountain View. We're all going to be over there together, Orange Campus, Culpeper Campus, all of, Mountain, all of Culpeper Baptist. We've got one service in the morning and one service in the evening, one at 10 and one at 5 o'clock. They're going to be absolutely identical. Pick one. Don't pick both. We don't have room for everybody. Absolutely identical. It's going to be amazing. We've been enjoying the time of planning, but I recognize we'll talk more about that then. Jesus is no longer a baby in a manger. He is the resurrected Messiah, holy and true. He's not your truth. You know how culture says that today. He's not my truth. He's absolute truth. And in those moments, I recognize that Jesus is the only truth and no one can shut the door to the kingdom to anyone he's held it open for. And no one can pry open the doors of the kingdom to which that door has been shut. That's absolute truth. These were the words that were sent and given to the church in the city of Philadelphia. We don't know a lot about the church, even from outside text, outside of scripture of the church in Philadelphia. We do know, began around the second, end of the first century, beginning the second century, this church existed to the mid 14th century. How old is that? Somebody can do the math. 1,200, 1,300 years old. Even when the Muslims began to move across what is modern day Turkey in the mid 11th century, that church still existed for 300 years in that context. Incredible. Incredible that which we know about the church there, the city of Philadelphia, obviously getting its name, Philadelphia. Where does that come from? 189 B.C.? We got the kings of Pergamum. You got Emenus and Atalas. They were brothers. Atalas II, Emenus, Emenus being the older. Atalas II came in behind him, reigned as king of Pergamum. Josh talked about that city a couple of weeks ago. And there was such a kindred spirit between those two brothers that they gave Atalas II the nickname Philadelphias, brother lover. And where did we get the name from? The union of two brothers and the power of that relationship. To this particular church, not all of them got it. There were incredible commendations from the Lord Jesus Christ about that, how they have lived out the faith, what, over many, many years. Revelations 3, 8 through 11. Listen, I'm gonna do, um, read it for you, the whole thing, and then come back and break it down. I know your deeds. See, I place before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word. You've not denied my name. I will make those who are the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars. I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. And since so you have kept my command and endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. Look at some of the things that characterize the church. Let's go ahead and put that up on the screen. The first one was, it's a church of little strength. Does that sound like a commendation to you? But it was. 
It wasn't the largest church of all the seven churches, but they were powerfully impacting the city of Philadelphia. In America, (coughs) numbers means God's blessing. Numbers means success, or so we like to believe. And so we think if the favor of God's on it, it must be bigger. It must be better. But God is saying to us, please understand numeric size doesn't matter to the Lord. It's spiritual power that can flow just as easily from a small church as it can from a large church. I started thinking about this over and over and over again. In this coming week, we have 14, 15, maybe more people being baptized here between our two campuses next week. Thank God someone didn't say, you know what? People are never going to get saved unless a big church goes after them. That's ridiculous. We're going to have the opportunity to listen to how God has moved on the lives of hearts of individuals, children, youth, and adults that have placed their faith in Jesus Christ and have come to the place of surrendering to the Lordship of Jesus. That has nothing to do with the size of a church. Salvation and transformation are displays of spiritual power, Mount View, and not church attendance. There were two more that he said uh, celebrating the church. The second one is they kept God's word. And what I love about this is, a lot, we, can, we can make a whole sermon out of this. I go back and I think about Job. Eliphaz, one of his friends, speaking to him, basically said that Job has great weakness. There's great wickedness and weakness in his life. And Job came back. Now on the screen, he said these words. I could preach the whole day on this. He said, I have not departed from the commands of his lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my daily bread. How many of you love to eat? Go ahead and own it. (laughs) How many of you love the word of God and consuming that? Which one do we love more? You hear Job? I have not departed from the commands of his lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my daily bread. The final one was this. They did not deny 1,300 years, 300 years surrounded with a Muslim influence. You've not denied my name. Despite the pressures, church in Philadelphia, church in Europe, church in Israel, Messianic ministries going on, all the persecution, all the hardship, church in America, they did not succumb to the pressure. They remained loyal no matter what it cost them. You want to look at persecution? Go to Revelations 14, verse 12 and following. Look at what you may face. Let me give you an example of this when it comes to not denying his name. It was two weeks ago. I was away on vacation with my wife. We were down in Emerald Isle. Who it's a rough place to vacation. No, it's sacrifice. Somebody had to do it. <laughs> so we went. We had friends down there. They had a home right on the water. We said, hey, it's free. We're coming. We're going to enjoy it. Happened. They also had one of their parents with them. She's an 86-year-old woman that we called Mima. That's an age of my own mother, so she endeared herself immediately to me. I've known her for many years, but didn't really spend a lot of time with her. But because the place is kind of small there on the first level, the only place she could get, wherever I went, she was. You kind of like, you kind of know people's movements during that week. And I began to take note. I began to watch. An 86-year-old woman get up in the morning early before I did, and when I come see her, she's sitting there on her little stool, Black glasses on, you know, because it's bright coming in the window and she's out looking. She's just pondering and praying. You see the prayers, hear the prayers. Pondering and praying as she looks out at the sea. Later on in the morning, she gets set up with, anybody know what an old CD player is? Anybody even know what those are anymore? An old CD player with a bunch of CDs just stacked up of scripture. They'd put the CDs on for her and she would sit there in that chair and she would listen to the word of God for several hours. Just listen. Behind those black glasses, I'd look over my computer and think, she's got to be asleep. I'd make a comment. She'd answer me. I'd say, man, she's just chewing and consuming the word of God. We'd have lunch together. And then the afternoon, on came TBN. And she sat there all afternoon consuming from Bible pastors, teaching the word of God. We'd go out to dinner. And after dinner, there'd be a little gun smoke in the early, early evening, people. Let me tell you, I haven't seen gun smoke for a long time, but it's a small place. You're going to watch gun smoke because the 86-year-old wants to watch gun smoke. And the day would happen, same thing, every single day, consuming the truth of the Word of God. One morning, I had to race back in. We were going out to play pickleball. It's a glorious vacation for me to get to play pickleball every single morning. 
I had to run back in to get my sunglasses. I come around, getting ready to go up the stairs. I come in agreement with something the pastor says online. And I make a comment to Meemaw. And she didn't hesitate to come and fire back a comment to me. And she said, Mark, he, referring to the Lord, he is worthy. He is worthy of all my attention, all my time, and all my worship. And then with almost a grimace on her face, she said these words. Remember, I'm at the base of the stairs. She said, today, today I even grieve. I grieve even the thought of dishonoring my God. I grieve at the thought of dishonoring my God. Now, how long does it take me to go 13 or 16 stairs? Maybe five seconds. Before I got to the top of the stairs, I had come under the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Tears were flowing down my cheeks. The Spirit of God spoke through that woman directly into my heart. Because a lot of us, including myself, we know what it's like to fail the Lord. And in those moments to come under conviction and to confess and repent, you know what I'm talking about. But there is a level of intimacy and union with God that I have failed to reach yet that that woman is living in at the moment where she can say, is she perfect? No, she's a sinner saved by grace. But yet she got to the point in life where she, a thought of dishonoring her God will cause her to grieve in the spirit. And I thought, Lord, teach me. I want to grow like that. The church of Philadelphia was honored because they didn't deny the name of God. And so then he comes up and says, look, I got a bunch of promises for you. These are things that he promised the church of Philadelphia. I call them astounding, astounding promises. The first one was this, your salvation is secure. I believe in eternal security. I believe that once somebody is genuinely and authentically saved, I'll talk about that in a moment. They're secure for all eternity. He said in verse 8, he said the words I've written a moment ago, I know your deeds. See, I place before you an open door that no one can shut. Most commentators and theologians understand that he was referring to salvation, a genuine conversion and transformation of a human life. And that's salvation that Christ gives us secure, but it goes beyond that, they believe. That almost unity and agreement there as you study the text that this also was an opportunity where God not only refers to salvation, but also open doors of ministry. How many of you ever get up in the morning and say, God, would you open a door for me to minister in your name today? If you don't do that, why don't we? Because that's what not, God, only, God not only wants to give us salvation, he wants to bring open doors of ministry. We're going to be sitting here as a family meeting here in just an hour or so, two hours, a little less than two hours from now. And we're going to be talking about vision and budget and all kinds of things. But at the end of the day, what are we praying for as a church? God opened for us doors of ministry that are in front of us that you're opening because what you open, no one can close. That's what I want us to be praying over and thinking about. It was the apostle Paul when he wrote to the church of Corinth. He said these words, but I will stay on at Ephesus. Change his mind until Pentecost because a great door for effective work has opened to me and there are many who oppose me. He wrote a letter to the church of Colossae. And he said these words, and pray for us too that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Amazing, right? But he goes on to give other praises to the Lord, to the church, other promises. He said this, you're going to experience victory. This victory takes on a, a perspective that you probably don't think is victory, but it is, victory will come despite great persecution. What did the word of God say in verse nine? I will make those who are the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, they, though they are not, but are liars. I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Now, when I first saw this a couple of weeks ago, I thought, Lord God, with all the anti-Semitism that was on the rise in our culture, demonic at the root, I said, Father, help me to understand this before I open my mouth. Because of their rejection of the Lord Jesus Christ, many Jews in that region have rejected the Messiah. Some of the Jews, he said, they're not of the synagogue of God. They're of the synagogue of Satan. You say, John, how do you write that? Jesus penned these words through John. May we never forget that. Though they were, they claimed to be Jews, he said they're not. But understand this, the people that were persecuting the church there in Philadelphia, they were racially Jews, they were culturally Jews, they were ceremonially Jews, but they weren't spiritually 
Jews. Paul, when he wrote his letter to the church of Rome, inspired by God in Romans chapter 2, he defined who's a Jew. Understand it's important today, especially what God said to the church. A person is not a Jew who's one only outwardly, nor is circumcision, that was the sign of the covenant of Abraham of the Old Testament, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly, and the circumcision is a circumcision of the heart by the Spirit, not by the written code, Old Testament. Such a person's praise is not from other people, but from God. I love this. The more I studied, the more I loved it. Christ made a promise to the church of Philadelphia. Hey, church, I want you to continue to be faithful to me. I want you to continue to believe and pray for open doors. I want you to go out into the culture. Yeah, the, maybe the Muslims in the middle 11th century. The Jews are there in the second and third century. I want you to go out and I want you to minister to them in the name of Jesus. Yeah, in some ways you're going to be persecuted by them. But guess what's going to happen? Because of your faithfulness to go and be in their proximity, I'm going to allow those who, who are Jews but are hardened in the heart of this moment to see the blessings that I have brought upon my church. And they are going to come under conviction the way I came under conviction going up those stairs when Mima spoke to me. Those individuals are going to come and they're going to, they're going to drop at your feet, not worshiping you, but praising God for the God that saved you and now saved them because they're going to have a circumcision of heart. God's going to save many of the Jews because of the Gentiles are faithful to be effective witnesses in their community. That was for Philadelphia, but I think about today. I think about with all the rise of anti-Semitism and some people are like, I'm not sure if I should put the blue box on my Facebook page. I mean, if I put the blue box on my car, somebody's going to key it. I thought these things myself. And all of a sudden, you try, all of a sudden you start distancing yourself. And I'm learning from this. I'm going, wait a second. I think most of us realize if we don't know the, the depth of God loves Israel. God loves the Jewish people. God has not and will never give up on those he willfully and intentionally chose to be a nation out of which he would bless the rest of the world. You recognize we're here today, Gentiles in Culpeper, Virginia. Why? Because God spoke to Jewish people and brought the good news and they took it to the world. And what is God asking us to do today? Don't separate yourself from my people. Press in Philadelphia. Press in Mountain View. Why? Because some of those very Jews, whether it be in the Middle East or be in Culpeper, Virginia, they're going to see the blessings of God that I have placed upon the church, and they're going to come and they're going to bow not before you, Mountain View. They're going to bow before me with a circumcision of heart. They're going to come to know the Messiah as Savior and Lord. What an incredible reality. We think persecution, stay away. Judgment, stay away. Danger, stay away. Jesus says to the church of Philadelphia, press in. Press in. And there was one more. Believers in Christ will be spared, I put it in quotes, the ultimate test. Verse 10, which is about four sermons in one verse. I'm not preaching them today. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. Four sermons. Here's a summary. To the Christians of Philadelphia, to believers all over the world, Jesus has promised to spare his children from the ultimate test. What is it? It depends on who you ask. Is it the seven years of tribulation that we read for in Revelation? Many will say yes. Is it part of the tribulation? Some will say yes. Is it the wrath of God, Revelation 16, that's right after the tribulation that the church will be prepared for? Some will say yes to that. The tribulation is that seven years that marks with the the peace treaty with Israel, and then you got the three and a half years, the the deception that happens, and the Antichrist obviously exposed for who he truly is, and then the great tribulation happens in the next three and a half years after that. If you want to get into all that, and it's a lot of fun if you enjoy that type of thing, I encourage, first encourage you to go back to Daniel chapter 9, but I never go back to Daniel without a big fat commentary beside me. I don't trust myself in Daniel without a commentary. It's just, it's good stuff, it's hard stuff. But when you get into the 70 weeks, basically the history of the world, 
We, most commentators say to agree today that we're between week 69 and 70. That is the era of the church. And there's pretty much an agreement that the, the week 70 will not begin until the church is raptured out of the world. And so you think, man, history has come a long way and there's not much to go. I believe that to be true. And so there's so much confusion about what to believe. There are people who believe the church is going to be raptured out of the world after the seven years of tribulation and before the Revelation 16 wrath of God. That's post-tribulation rapture. Some will believe that the church will be leaving the world at the mid-tribulation, at the great deception of the Antichrist before the great tribulation begins and the church will leave at that point. Others believe, like himself at this moment in time, that the church will exit the world prior to the tribulation, after, in the middle of persecution, before tribulation, and that's pre-tribulation rapture. And then you got the pan-tribulation people. And some of you know what that is. Some of you say, I have no idea. And it's all going to pan out in the end. <laughs> that's true. As a matter of fact, it might as well be marked in there because that's what I think half the world is. They say, I don't know. But here's what I tell my kids. Even though I'm, I'm staunchly in one place and say, I do not have the corner on the theological market. Lord, if you change your mind, I need to be ready. If he didn't change his mind, if I'm not right, he didn't change his mind. That was silly. Here's the deal. None of us know the level of persecution we're going to have to face as a church in America before the Lord returns. Nobody. And the challenge is, do we know the difference between persecution and tribulation? Especially if you're pre-tribulation rapture, like church is leaving, what if we have to walk through a whole lot of persecution? You feel that? You say, that feels like tribulation to me, but it's really persecution. We don't know the difference in those moments. The best way I can define it is this. This way I've tried to do it over a couple of years, and if the Lord gives me a new illustration, he's more than willing to do so. You get a young mother, first-time mom, first-time dad. They're going to have a child. Coming to the end of their pregnancy, they've read all the books. They've taken the Lamaze class. And the contractions begin to hit. And there's a whole lot of pain. Remember, first time mom. And all of a sudden in the middle of the night, maybe 11 o'clock at night, oh, honey, man, we got to go. This baby's coming. Putting on the clothes, getting the kids to the neighbors, and off you go to the hospital. Only get to the hospital, and this elderly nurse goes, oh, sugar. And she says, that's not labor pains. It's what? It's Braxton Hicks. Get back in the car at 1 a.m. in the morning. You're driving back home, and a very unwise husband looks at his wife in his fatigue and says, Honey, how could you not know the difference? We took Lamaze class. We did all the breathing. I mean, how could you not know? And with whatever grace she has left in her, she looks over at 1 a.m. in the morning and says, I don't know, dear. I don't know how I couldn't tell the difference in the pain of Braxton Hicks or real labor pains. Maybe simply for the reason it hurt a lot. That might be true. But I believe it's the same persecution. How many of us in history have ever been through any part of the seven years of the tribulation? None of us. Some of us haven't even been through the persecution that others around the world have faced. We don't know the difference. I broke all kinds of timelines from our girls over the years. Morgan still even has her own. But I put a big asterisk at the top of it. Dad doesn't ultimately know. This is what I believe to be true. But you better be ready. No matter what form of persecution you have to walk through. I had a doctor. Well, I'll get to that in a minute. On that note, we need each other. We need to stand together in this. There's a lot coming. On this note, I'm going to turn this over to the host in orange. You guys can have it from here. Let me show this first. In Revelation 3.11, the word of God says this. I'm coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. That's the verse. No one will take your crown. I said, I believe in eternal security. I believe that when someone is genuinely saved by God and the spirit of God dwells in, that cannot be lost, cannot be taken away from you. But there's a whole lot of people must be because Matthew 7 said that many people cry, Lord, Lord, and God said, I never knew you. So we need to make authentically sure that we are truly saved by the grace of God. I believe there are ways that we can know that. 
But I started going through the scripture and people were like, is that true? Colossians 1, 22 and 23, this is what Paul had said to the church. But now he has been reconciled to you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish, free from accusation. We're all going, yay. And then he says, if you continue in your faith, establish and firm and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. First John 2, John writes about those who had left the church, couldn't handle it, getting a little too hot. They went out from us, but they didn't really belong to us. But if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going showed that none of them, none of them belonged to us. Folks, Christ has promised to those who faithfully persevere, who himself, not, not simply given mere mental gymnastics to this idea of faith, nothing will take your crown. But hear me. Hear me loud and clear for such care somebody to complete the death. Does that mean that their Christian who's authentically saved will never doubt? Help me out. No, no, it doesn't. Does it mean that they can never fall away for a season and come back? No, it doesn't mean that. Does it mean that we're never going to mess up, walk in deception, succumb to an idol or a lesser lover ever in our lives? No, it doesn't mean that. But it does mean that prevailing and pers- that persevering faith given by God through the power of the Holy Spirit is one that I return to him in confession and repentance and I'm able to resist and repent and walk in restoration and prevail to the end. I had a doctor call me up a couple weeks ago and said, I want to see you in my office. That's never good, right? Not good. But I, of course, I hadn't been to him, so he didn't have any tests. He's a believer in Jesus Christ, loved the guy dearly. I went and I love this guy. I've known him for years. And there's the Bible front and center his, on his desk, Christian books everywhere. And between patients, that's what he does. He studies the word of God. My brother happens to be, used to be a pre-tribulation rapture person with a study. He's come to the place where he believes it's at the end of the tribulation before the wrath of God. And that's where he stands. And he's concerned. He's concerned for the church. He's concerned for those who believe. And, I, and it's, it's legitimate for those who really don't have faith in Jesus Christ. They're simply coming to churches and they're walking in the coattails of mom or dad or grandma and granddad or they're enjoying the relative calm of our Christian society and they're just walking through the motions. You say, but what happens, Mark? What happens in that day that a little bit of persecution kicks in? That person who's all happy about Jesus suddenly becomes despondent and disillusioned. They don't even know the Lord. All of a sudden they regret they've ever signed up for this. They say, I've never signed up for this. They become despairing, recant their faith, the faith that they never had. They reject Christ, take the mark of the beast, and lost for all eternity. That's real. Not for the one who's truly saved, but for the one who thinks they are just cruising through life. They know, oh yeah, I I grew up in church. I guess that's good enough. But when the persecution hits, there's no Holy Spirit inside of you to keep you grounded. We sang a song about God's holding us through the veil. That's what I think about. When the persecution comes on or any form of tribulation, if I'm wrong in my theology, eschatology, any persecution comes along, I need to be able to stand. And that's why I wanted to take communion today. For those of you who are in here, you know that we've got communion we're sharing today. I encourage you to take that out for a minute, would you? There's a reason for it. He said, hold on. He said, hold on. And then that moment, he said, I'm going to make some promises to you, church. I'm going to make some promises to you. And in the scripture, in Revelation 3, 12 and 13, he said these words. Go ahead and put them up. Thank you. The one who is victorious. You have the spirit of God in you, the spirit of Christ. Persevering to the end. Yeah, you might make a ton of mistakes along the way. But the spirit of God and that conviction bring you back. I'm going to make you a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on them my new name. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. I want you to take that piece of bread in your hand for a moment, believer. He said to the church of Philly, hold on. I want you to hold on to that for just a second. He said, I'm going to make you a pillar in the house of my God. Well, that doesn't really kind of sound like too exciting, but like, okay, I'm going to 
I'm going to hold up the roof of God for eternity. <laughs> but what did pillar signify? Solid. Steadfast. Immovable. For those who are children of the Most High God, nothing can rip you out of the hands of God Almighty. He also said, I'm going to write on you the name of my God and name of the city of my God, the New Jerusalem. When I was going to school, when a teacher said, you're going to have a quiz today, students, take out a piece of paper. Remember how this went down. Take out a piece of paper, take out a pencil. What's the very first thing you had to do? Write your name, top right-hand corner. At least that was for us. Why? Because whatever you put on that piece of paper, you were going to own. You got a good grade, did your homework, studied, you got a good grade, you're going to own that. You got a poor grade, you're going to what? You're going to own that too. Jesus said, for the church who was faithful, who stood to the test of time because of the Holy Spirit dwelling in them, I'm going to write the name of my God in the city of the New Jerusalem. Ownership. God says, I possess my beautiful brothers and sisters, children, the Most High God. Do you believe that? Take the bread that was part of that communion, first communion, that Jesus broke, gave it to his disciples, says, take in remembrance of me. After communion, Jesus took the cup, poured it, gave it to his disciples. New covenant in my blood. The circumcision of the heart is what he was looking for. And Jesus said, if you want to put that scripture back up one more time. Last thing Jesus said, and I will also write on them my new name. When my mom would call me as a kid and say, Mark Andrew Jenkins, probably not going to be a good thing. We know today the Lord Jesus Christ somewhat, some better than others by intimacy and walking with him and holiness and righteousness. But one day, when we enter eternity, God writes his, Jesus writes his full name. We're going to know him fully for all eternity. Those moments where you come to church or you sing a song at home and you feel so close to him, you feel like you know him, it's that experience multiplied by a million every single day for those who persevere to the end because they're in the new covenant. Take and drink in remembrance of him. Father, I thank you. I thank you for this time we have to worship. I thank you for the truths of your word. Father, I pray for anyone here today, anyone online, that has never confessed you as Lord and Savior. You are the only one that's holy. You're the only one that's true. You're the only one that holds the key to the kingdom. No one will ever enter your kingdom by any other way than through the Lordship of Jesus Christ. So Father, if there's anyone in this place that would own it before you, that they've been riding on the coattails of someone else's faith, they've been enjoying this calm, relatively calm Christian culture, but they recognize the Spirit doesn't live in them. My friends, you can cry out to Jesus right now and say to him, Jesus, God, I want Jesus in my life. I invite Jesus, your one and only Son, to come into the very recesses of my heart and mind. Forgive me of my sin. Take away my guilt and my shame. And help me to begin to live my life for you through the power and the strength that comes as you come into me. With something prayed like that, Mountain View, there may be people here today that have made that decision for Jesus. I encourage you, solidify that by letting someone know. Whether writing it down, telling me before you leave, or telling a friend that came with you to church. Don't let the enemy rob it from you. For the Lord wants to do a magnificent and miraculous work in your life. Father, may we as Mountain View be a persevering church. With whatever persecution comes our way, may we not be the eye for the eye church. But may we be a church that lives in such a way before you. That even those who would persecute us in the name of Jesus or believe they're doing a favor to you, God, may many of them see the blessings that flow out upon those who call Mountain View home and in their, their recesses of their heart and mind, whether at work or driving, may they come under conviction as I did when Meemaw spoke to me. They truly heart, give their hearts and souls 
to you in that moment. God, I love you. We love you. Thank you, Lord, for these letters. In Jesus' name and God's people said, amen. Let's worship.